you go. Um, uh, let me just give you a quick introduction. Uh, Rodrigo, I think I'm correct when I say this. You're originally from Minas Gerais, the state of Minas Gerais, or Belo Horizonte? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so that's, I wanted to be sure. I knew we'd mentioned that before, but uh, he did his graduate work, or graduation, undergraduate and post, uh, postgraduate training in computational and biomolecular physics uh, in Sao Carlos, Sao Paulo. Then he did uh, a postdoc in cryo-M at Imperial College in London uh, in the mid-2000s. And in 2010, went to CNEP AMI, the Centre National Energy uh, uh, Research in uh, Energy and Materials in Campinas. And he is responsible really for implementing or installing the cryo-M instruments there in Eliani Nano. Um, He's been there now since then. He's uh, one of the leaders in the field, not just here in Brazil, but through all of South America. There is no other cryo-EM system yet. Uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, they will be getting one in uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, they're trying to get one in Uruguay, but now they're, at the moment there is no other instrument and Rodrigo is responsible and has uh, uh, usually has different uh, announces when they will accept projects to be studied and that's those are evaluated twice a year and this last time there were I think something like 56 projects were submitted for analysis and more or less 25 will probably uh, be studied or they'll turn out a lot of data. Uh, He's also Rodrigo, I'm getting to know him better and better. He's been involved in, in microscopy societies here in Brazil, SBM Yami, and others, uh, other things here, but also in South America. He's one of the leaders in, in various uh, new uh, networks that are being formed, uh, some actually some older and some newer. So he's now very involved in Latin American bioimaging, which we were meetings recently, and also with various CZI projects. He's involved in one with CryoEM and submitted another one recently with a, a new CryoEM network that they're building. So Rodrigo's uh, one of the young leaders in, in microscopy across Latin America and uh, has a very impor important role in, in pushing all of this forward. So. Rodrigo, thank you very much for agreeing to participate. And I know you're busy, but thanks very much. I'll let you talk. So thank you very much, Greg, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, first of all, before sharing my screen, I just have to, to say I had this like small problem with my computer. So I had to move my presentation from my Windows virtual machine. It was just like now uh, to Linux. So there is a missing, you know, uh, formatting and movies won't work, so I delete some, but um, it will be okay. Just apologizing, maybe things will not show up as I would like to. So um, I have to share my screen. Um, just a second. So do you see my screen? Is it working? Saying okay, it's fine. Okay. Um, okay. Um, sorry, just trying to organize myself here. Okay, do you see my mouse as well here? Do you see my mouse? Yes, right. yes, I can see it, it's fine. Okay, so, and you don't see you, right? There's no, no other screen to see, okay. So um, when I was 
uh, preparing uh, this presentation, um, I, I was thinking about uh, what would be maybe interesting to, to show, and especially knowing that I would I would present after Roland, so it's a bit more. Uh, it adds some challenge to the to the, the presentation. So uh, I decide to just collect a few examples of what we've been doing here in the. Uh, and the projects we are uh, collaborating with, uh, and also uh, show a bit of non cryogenic electron microscopy. So, um, when thinking about the infrastructure that most of uh, Latin America has access to, I think it's important to show a bit of projects that we have to, to like try to move forward and, and, and to, to go to a different. A higher level of operation with uh, high-end cryo-electron microscopy, high resolution, but also that depending on the project, depending on what we want to, to discuss or what is like the question that is being you know, posed, we can do some um, nice studies also with like electron microscopy and, and uh, negative stain in terms of uh, uh, structure of, of biological micromolecules. So, um, that's a, that's what I hope to, to show you by, by the end of my talk. Um, so when we talk about cryo-EM, uh, cryo-EM is really like lots of different stuff. Like we can talk about, uh, like in this case, what we are seeing here, like liposomes in ice. So this is like soft materials. You can use um, cryo-EM to, to prepare um, materials. Uh, or you can go for structural biology, like what we've seen here, which is a loop, a nice loop in a structure. In a collaboration, collaboration we are uh, working with uh, uh, the Bioreneubus and National Laboratory here at Santa Fe with uh, Mario Murakami. So uh, for, the, uh, for this talk, I will focus on structural biology and what we can do with a single particle. So when we talk about single particle, uh, let me just do so. so when we talk about single particle, you probably heard about what is uh, what was called resolution revolution. So that was, a, um, well, actually it was a paper by Benny Kubrand, uh, but also there was this huge change in the, the level of the resolution that you could achieve using single particles cryo EM. And that was about uh, in, was about like 2015, uh, 13, 14, uh, mainly because, uh, because of the introductions of uh, direct um, electron uh, detectors. So uh, after the, this, this beginning of the resolution revolution, things got like more and more fast and in terms of uh, cryo-EM being more uh, important in, in structural biology, especially high resolution structural biology. Uh, and then in 2017, we, we had the, the Wiley Prize in the beginning of the year for, uh, in biomedical science, and that was uh, given to Marie Van Heel, Johan Frank and Richard Henderson. And in the same year, the Nobel Prize to Jacques de Boucher, Johan Frank, and Hishel Henderson. Um, so that was uh, like a recognition of how mature uh, cryo-electron microscopy, but particularly a single particle cryo-EM was or, or had achieved. Okay, so let's talk a bit about single particle cryo-EM. And uh, uh, first of all, like when we think about uh, 3D uh, imaging, on electron microscopy. These two major like, groups of techniques comes to mind. So we can talk about cryo-electron tomography or uh, single particle cryo-EM. Uh, and Roland just showed us uh, uh, examples on, on both of them, but uh, it's important to, 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 to have it like very clear. When we, when we are talking about Cryo-electron tomography, it implies, as we see on, on this side, that we are working like on one area of the cell or whatever you are imaging. And you are doing uh, 
many images in the same area, changing the orientation of the, the sample. Okay, and do you this since you change the orientation, you have uh, different views in terms of orientation, and then you can reconstruct the 3D information based on this uh, different orientations of that specific area. And you could be seeing here like an organism, a cell, or even a macromolecule, a virus, or a virus, or whatever. When you go for single particle cryo EM, that is a, a different story. What you do. Uh, you have a set of images of particles and uh, these particles are in different orientations. So as you take like hundreds of images like that and in each image you have particles with different orientations, you can then use uh, these images, these particles to um, uh, orient themselves one against each other and then uh, uh, reconstruct the structure that you aim to. So in this case, you are not tilting the, the sample. And in this case, you're tilting the sample. So it's just to keep in mind. And in both cases, you are not working in the reciprocal space. So there's no uh, diffraction in terms of direct measuring diffraction uh, involved. It's all direct spaces, all imaging, okay? So it's not like, you don't need crystals or uh, you don't work in the same way you would work uh, in crystallography. Okay, so, um, and then in, in terms of single particle cry AM, then there is a, a pipeline. So you basically, you, you freeze your samples, you go to the microscope, then you collect lots of images. Each image has lots of particles as we can see here. And the uh, data processing is like you go through like a class average like here and then uh, align particles one to another and then you have your structure okay so for understanding the the, the base preparation and um i think roland, roland just showed us a great slide on that with different profiles of ice in, in a grid um, but so in, a, in an ideal case, what you have is like, uh, you have your grid here, it, grid has those squares with holes. And what you want in one of these holes is to have this situation. So this is uh, the hole seen from the side. You have here in a green or blue, you have the ice and the particles well spread inside this layer of ice, not only uh, in the layer, but also if you check the hole, you want them spread apart, uh, not like in a good concentration. So if you take an image, you see lots of, of particles, uh, but not uh, too dense in terms that they are touching uh, each other a lot or overlapping each other. So this, this is uh, the balance that you have to achieve when preparing the grid and uh, um, checking the concentration and how do you see that in your grid. And of course that can be done for like proteins as we see here on the left or material science as we see uh, on the right, okay? So this is the process of uh, uh, grid preparation. Uh, you, you have different um, vitrification systems. So here's one of them. It's basically what you, you go through like uh, liquefying ethane as we see here. So this, this uh, recipient here has e liquid ethane inside. Then you put your sample in the grid. There is, of course, like typically here you have three microliters. So there will be an excess of sample. The grid has uh, this layer of carbon with holes. You just have a really small amount of your sample to, to, to frozen the grid. So you take out the excess uh, of the sample with this blotting process, these two pads with filter papers here, they will touch the grid and take the excess of the sample away. Then uh, the grid is plunged inside liquid ethane. And from that point on, you have to manipulate the grid in um, liquid nitrogen or uh, at low temperature, like vapor of, of liquid nitrogen, okay? So here you see someone like taking the tweezers to put the grid 
in a small box in liquid nitrogen, and then you move uh, that grid always in the presence of liquid nitrogen or uh, in the microscope. So in the microscope, you have different uh, strategies or, or softwares to control the microscope, but typically you will have a, a automated system to do the data collection because what you need is to collect lo lots of images. Um, so typically you take like a few, one or two days or even more than that to, to do a, um, a full data, data collection. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the, again, on the left, the grid, the holes in the grid, okay, with um, some sample. Uh, these uh, colored areas are areas that you are marking where you can, where you want to take your images, where you want the microscope to perform actions of like checking drift and checking the foggy. And here what we see is like an ongoing data collection with the, the grid and all the squares of the grid. Uh, here, one of the squares with the eyes. Uh, here, the hole that's being imaged at the moment. And some of them are empty, some of them with eyes, like these two have eyes, these three are empty. And the images that is being um, uh, collected. Okay, so after doing this data collection, you have your as I mentioned before, your set of images, and then you can start processing to reach, um, you know, a structure or the resolution you want. So I'll go through a few examples very briefly of what we want or what we do. In all of them are um, collaboration projects. So we are working with many different groups to uh, support, uh, those groups to learn and use single particle cryo EM. So this, this project is being developed with uh, Biorenewables uh, National Laboratory at Senepeng uh, with a group of Mario Murakami. So they work with uh, these enzymes uh, that break down. So they, they, they are responsible for uh, the metabolism of, of mannose. And in, in this case, uh, we had like three different proteins to, to work with. They are quite similar, we are seeing here. So um, the overall uh, structure is, is quite similar, but they are actually three different proteins. And in, in this case, this was the kind of project that you, you can um, take to like higher resolution. So in this case, we had um, four structures. So one of the proteins, we, we, we had a, a mutant of the protein. But um, all, of, all, all of them, but uh, we had resolutions of like 2.6, 2.7 to, to up to uh, three angstroms. Actually, one of them was a bit more than that, a bit less than that, 3.4 angstroms. But that means that we can have areas, regions of the proteins that we can see with this level of details. Like you, you clearly see uh, the, the side chains of the amino acids and you can um, go to a molecular understanding on, on how the protein is actually working or organizing itself, okay? So just to uh, show a few, few details of these proteins, in one case, we can see this density, which, which is associated to an ion or like loops like that, like beautiful loops, well organized like that. And also in this case, one amino acid, like the, the position of a side chain, like here, the same amino acid in two different structures of two different proteins with a slightly difference in the, the, the organization of the side chain. So all these uh, details can be seen if you go for resolutions like better than, typically better than three times resolution. Okay, and, and they are necessary in projects that you want to understand, like for in the case of uh, this project, uh, enzyme or uh, um, active site of the enzyme and how uh, actually like the enzyme is working at a, mole at a molecular level, okay? So there are other projects that you can like have really good result not even reaching the same resolution. So typically viruses, um, at least big viruses, you won't have like 
high as high resolution as we saw before. Here's the structure of my virus that was a project conducted by the group of Rafael Elias in uh, uh, National Laboratory of Biosciences at Senepain. And so uh, his group was interested in um, elucidating the, the structure of the Maillard virus, and that was a, a collaboration between uh, Elian Nano and, and his group. And in this case, uh, we could uh, reach uh, the resolution of 4.4 angstrom, and that was like uh, enough to, to actually see lo lots of different uh, structures present in the virus. For instance, all that uh, if you see here on this 3D view, but also like in this cut views, you can see all the transmembrane uh, proteins, you can see uh, all the proteins that form the capsid. So uh, it was um, enough to understand what what they were interested in at that moment. Of course, since we are imposing um, symmetry in this case, you don't have information of the, 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 the genetic material that you have inside the, the virus. Okay, so, but that's because of the processing that is being done. Another project that I would like to mention is, is this uh, project on septins, uh, which is uh, a project conducted by uh, the group of, of Richard Gard and Ana Paula Araujo, and here uh, Richard and Ana Paula, and Deborah, Deborah is a PhD student that's really working hard on, on this project. And here the, the, the aim was to understand, to elucidate this structure of an excimer of septins. Actually, um, excimers of septin, there was a previous structure on X-ray uh, crystallography, based on X-ray crystallography of a fiber of septins. So actually the, the isolated excimer as a single particle was the, the, the first time that the structure was seen. And here, uh, I was supposed to have a movie here, but just to discuss that, they are flexible. So there, there is a, some flexibility in terms of, um, let's say there's some bending in this, this area of the protein. So if you, if you do single particle, one of the things that we, we can have <coughs> is that since, since you are collecting many copies of the protein, if, if in your data set you have uh, variability in your data set, in, in your uh, cause, for instance, by some flexibility in the proteins, you can, during your data processing, um, isolate different uh, conformations and actually see how um, how are the different conformations that the protein can assume and also try to infer some flexibility. So in this project, one of the things, uh, uh, not, not only the, the structure of the, the excimer was uh, better uh, uh, studied by single particle cryogen instead of X-ray crystallography, but also Deborah could um, identify that there is some flexibility associated to the, the protein. And, and how was this flexibility? Sorry, I don't, I don't have to move. Um, And then moving on. So those are cases of the cryo-EM where you aim at like either um, high resolution or like big uh, structures like viruses or trying to see some flexibility. But if you don't have cryo-EM and you still have some electron transmission electron microscope, you, you can do, still can do something about uh, structural uh, understanding of micromolecules. So what, what is negative stain? Negative stain is actually a quite easy and, and uh, quick to prepare technique. You just like you stain, uh, what we are seeing here is like a grid from the side. So this is carbon, a thin layer of carbon proteins on top of that, and then you stain uh, the proteins and you can see the images of the, the proteins uh, in a way that is quite straightforward, forward, but actually like on, uh, on the disadvantage side, you have very limited resolution. This is actually a technique that is prone to uh, 
particle, the, the structure of the particle can be distorted by the, the, this technique. And also there are other artifacts that you can have um, uh, when you use this. Um, okay, but what, what you can do, one, one of the projects that we, a few years ago, we, we started working with, was this project uh, a group of uh, Czech Farah when German, which is now a uh, prof um, uh, prof uh, scholar at uh, Faculdade de Medicina de Ribeirão Preto, the uh, USP. Um, he was a postdoc in a Czech lab, and they were working with this type four secretion systems. And we, at that time, we started doing some negative stain and some studying on negative stain. Let me just see. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. So this, what we see here on the left is negative stain of the protein. And then uh, we did all the uh, evolution. We didn't have a CRIOS, we didn't have um, how to go for high resolution in this project, but we were able to use negative stain to uh, start assessing the projects project started evolving the project and then even going to the first steps of cryoem what we see here on the right and that project then they they started a collaboration uh, in Birkbeck to take that project and actually using data collection in diamond in Nibic, uh, they were able to do the full structure of the protein so uh, in the initial steps, uh, what I want to say here is like in the initial steps of a structural project, especially the challenge ones, you can start working with negative stain and even like cryo in, in an entry level uh, cryo EM facility. And it's, this is actually very important. If we think about like the overall um, system, like the overall idea on how to to move projects to high-end electron microscope, it's really important that we have this kind of pipeline well established in different laboratories and especially very, very close to the biochemistry uh, lab to the, to the bench. So we can you can quickly go from sample preparation to microscopy back and forth and up to having a project that can go um, to, to the next level. Okay, and this is just another example. This is not a project that we participated. It was, uh, a project uh, from Lisandro Otero and uh, collaborators uh, on Leloa Institute in Argentina. And they did the data collection here uh, in Campinas and uh, they were able to to do the structure of the protein they, they were interested in. And the nice thing here is, is it was like it was a negative stain, but uh, they used single particle analysis to reconstruct the, the 3D structure of the protein. So even if you have a low resolution data set like negative stain, you can go for a 3D reconstruction, depending of course on what you're seeing, the size and like the information you have to um, use together with the structure you get. Uh, this is another example still on, uh, on, on the septins study from uh, the group of Richard uh, and Ana Paula, and uh, again done by Deborah, which is a, a PhD student. At that time, she was a master's student. And uh, that uh, study was done before the structure, the septine structure I showed you. And at that moment, so what we are seeing here on the left is negative stain uh, preparation of septine. So what we're seeing here is one eczema, the same axiom that I showed you the structure. Uh, here in the detail, we can see the axiom. So if you take lots of them and you average them, like align them and average, you get an image like that. So this is uh, an axiom of septins. And actually you have here septins of types five, six, and seven. Um, so you have two fives, two six, and two seven septins here. And the, uh, question here was the following. Um, <clears throat> there was this uh, info, uh, uh, knowledge that the order of the eczema would be, uh, in this case of septin 5, 6, 7, would be like 7, 6, 5, 5, 6, 7. Uh, but since the structure was uh, obtained by a filament, 
okay uh so it could be this one or this one five, five six seven seven six five uh so in a filament you cannot really know like the the, the edge of the hexamers because it will repeat um again so five six seven seven uh, six five five six seven and so on so the, the idea here was to try to understand to identify uh the order if the order was correct and actually uh what they did was to do this construction of mbp 567 and then we did data collection of lots of of um, many many reads actually with this kind of negative stain information here and with uh, statistical analysis we were able to what we are seeing here on the left are like average after classification of excimers okay, with MBPs attached to the protein 5 and in different positions. So what we see is that the MBP, which is this extra dot that appears on the, the, this class average, are always appearing on the edge of the filament, so on the edge of the excimer. So it indicates that the protein, so the, the five, the protein five, the, the septin fives actually at the edge, not in the center as was assumed uh, before. So, and this is like all done using negative stain and uh, single uh, part of the processing that we do in single part analysis, which is like the, the classifications and the average. So um, this was a, a, strategy, a strategy that we developed to, to, to better understand that. And we were able to, to show the, the correct order of the excimer. And after that, then we moved to the, the, the cryo project uh, and we had the structure of this, this excimer. And of course, then having the structure at 3.3 angstrom uh, resolution, you clearly see uh, which septins are in each position, okay? So this is a good example of projects in negative state. Uh, one uh, last thing that I would uh, like to mention when talking about uh, single particle analysis is that now there are a few labs and few projects starting to work with time-resolved cryo-EM, which is basically, again, I, I apologize, I don't have a movie that I would like to show you, but I'll try to explain. Like, it's basically, you can spray a mixture of um, two reagents uh, in a grid, for instance, for instance, a protein, so two proteins or a protein and the ligand, uh, in a way that you spray it very quickly, so the reaction occurs and you froze the reaction before it reaches uh, reach, uh, it ends. Uh, so you will trap in the ice, you trap in the grid, um, intermediate states of that reaction, okay? Um, the, the idea is to work uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, hundreds of milliseconds or even like a bit below um, um, tens of, of, of milliseconds, okay? Uh, here, what we are seeing is an example of um, a ribosome. Um, um, so the, the, the cycle of uh, uh, ribosome recycling and uh, what we're seeing here in this graph, uh, so the, this, is, this is what is a paper from uh, Johan Frank's group, these two papers, and what they're showing here is that they were able to trap at this like, point in time uh, grids with different uh, conformations of ribosome in this recycling cycle. So if they do a kind of inventory of the complexes they found at this time, okay, which is uh, 140 milliseconds, they found like seven different uh, structures. Of course, the resolution, you can see the resolution here is different because the, the proportion between them uh, is different. Like you can have like less 
populated in terms of some species than others. So, but this is a, a technique that will uh, allow to try to investigate reactions of, of proteins. Again, this is all uh, in vitro, so you have to purify and, and have to have your sample well controlled. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what I would like to, to, to show in terms of, of single particle cryo-EM. Just to, to finalize, I would like to show a, a bit of Cinepane. So this is the, the campus we work with. We work on this is on the corner here. We have a nano. All the microscopies are here. Um, uh, of course, you, you probably heard about Sirius, which is uh, the, the the new light source, which is here on the top, with many different beam lines. Probably some of you are actually like users. Uh, we have our microscopy, uh, which. Um, uh, we now have these four electron microscopes. Actually, this one is more dedicated to material science, but these other three are dedicated to uh, structural biology and a uh, bit of cell and tissue, uh, and also all the infrastructure necessary for sample preparation, including a, a biosafety level two area where we can prepare grids of, let's say, viruses or any other organisms. And of course, um, infrastructure, uh, computational infrastructure, which is now a bit better than this. This was a very initial. And so I would like to thank all the, the collaborators that I mentioned uh, here. So actually um, they do all the, 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 uh, the, the, the science of the biological science of this project, uh, Czech Farah, and Bruno, which is a, PhD, uh, a postdoc in his lab now, German, which was originally a uh, postdoc in, in Czech's lab, and now is a professor at Faculdade uh, de um, uh, Ribeirão Preto, University of São Paulo, uh, Mario Merakami, Camila, and, and Rosa, um, uh, that work on, on biorenewables la national laboratory, Richard, Anna Paul, and Deborah from the Physics Institute at San Carlos, the project of the subteams, and uh, Rafael Elias, uh, Laís, and, and Daniela from Ellen Bio and in Senepen. Uh, I showed you the, the project that we worked on, on the Mayaro virus, and of course, all the institutions that fund us uh, to have this uh, working. And as, as Greg mentioned recently, we got a, a CGI project as well for um, uh, improvements in, in our core facility. So um, this is our internal team. I'd like to thank all, all of them. Um, Antonio, CryoM specialist, Cyan, postdoc, Fabio, IT specialist, Mariana, also CryoM specialist, Danny, our technician, Marine Verhe, our senior uh, uh, CryoM uh, scientist, Alexandre, uh, also a crime specialist and here myself. So uh, thank you very much for your time and now I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Greg, I think your microphone's off. Thank you very much. Oh, hi, Diego. It was very good. Thanks very much. Um, I always... Do you have a question? Uh, uh, Douglas Makita has a question. Douglas. Hi, uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for this great presentation. It was very good for to see a general view, overview about everything that's happening in, in your labs. And could you tell us a little bit about the computation, computation computational structure needed to get these results and something like an processing capacity and storage space required. Okay. Please. <laughs> uh, okay, so typically uh, data collection can, can have a few terabytes. It depends if you process, if you compress your data or not and how, how large you need it. But I, I would say, um, Typically, you will have a few terabytes of data set uh, to start with. Then you have to process that, and it, it really depends on the programs you are using. So if you think about, um, I would say, um, maybe 10 terabytes, or it can be a bit more or less per project, um, 
of five to 10 terabytes per project, depending on the size of the data collection and how you process your data. Uh, I would say it's, it's, it's reasonable. As for uh, processing, you can, you can have from a GPUs to multi-core systems. Um, it, it, again, it depends on the methods and softwares you want to use. Some of them um, exploit uh, GPUs. Um, sometimes if you have like different softwares to use, you can ex use GPUs in different steps of the process. Or you can have some that are typically just for uh, multi-core uh, systems. So if, if you have a computer with like Two, two GPUs or, or a server with two to four GPUs, you probably are um, well if you have a software that uses GPUs. Other than that, if you are talking about CPUs, I would say you have to have like tens to hundreds of CPUs to, to do things in a reasonable time. But all, all of that really depends on how big is the data set, what kind of strategies you are using and yeah. So you, you can use a, a like a, a notebook if you want. It's just like how, how much time it would take and you know where you would put your data. So you, okay. Okay. Thank you. Does, does it answer your question? Yeah. yeah. No, uh, of course, it's not the uh, if you have a, a, a facility, then it scales up. Like now we are installing almost two petabytes of storage just because we don't have space anymore to to put the data. So. Yeah. Um, I think I, I actually, Rodrigo, I think this is a good time that maybe you can say something about the CryoM, the Brazil CryoM school. Would you like to? Okay. Um, actually, yeah, I, I, I was supposed to have a, another slide here just to mention that we uh, will have a, a workshop, a CryoM workshop. And thanks, thanks for, for mentioning that, Greg in end of November, beginning of December. So that's from 29th of December to 1st, sorry, of November to 1st of December. It's a Tuesday to Thursday in between two games of Brazil in the World Cup. So Brazil will play <laughs> on Monday, Friday. Don't be concerned about that. You can come to the workshop. Uh, and... Uh, uh, applications are open, so if you go to the website of Ellen Nano uh, and Senepain, you find the applications open, and we would like to welcome any, anyone that wants to, to really have this hands-on experience. It will be a workshop for 20, 20 people. We really want to have these three days of hands-on experience, very intense on <clears throat> data collection, sample preparation, data processing, and so, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for pointing out, Greg. Now, there's another, I, I'm blanked on the exact name, but there's also the other school that you Oh, yeah, that is the, the Brazil school, which is the data processing. It's like two weeks. And that we are planning for next year, maybe. Uh, it's, it's still not sure what, what are the dates. But there is an, another one that will be open probably by beginning of next year, this, the applications, which is a, a, a Sao Paulo Advanced Sciences School, which is uh, supported by FAPESP and it's being organized by Chuck. Uh, it will be in the Chemistry Institute in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And that will be also like two weeks of um, all the uh, processing okay. and uh, uh, science beh behind single particle cry yeah. So that would be in Sao Paulo and it's being organized by Chemistry Institute of University of Sao Paulo. Yeah, these are uh, only or asking these things because I think it's good also for, for people to know, especially the younger students or people that are still thinking about a career because the area of cryo-EM and this electron microscopy in general, but especially cryo-EM, single particle. Uh, if you have, if you walked into the United States right now, you could have a job tomorrow. So 
I mean, yeah. it's one of the, it's extremely competitive and the, the salaries are extremely high at the moment. So I don't know how it will be in 10 years, but a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies and universities, everybody needs people that have the experience. So it's, uh, uh, if somebody's not in this or not decided about exactly what way and you're interested in microscopy, it's something to, to consider uh, for going forward. So, yeah. And uh, I think you were uh, mentioning like what would be in 10 years. I think as, as Roland uh, showed us before, I, I think we're moving really, really fast to subtomogram average, to uh, in situ uh, structural biology. So, uh, all that I showed here is something that still demands that you uh, have your protein purified. And of course, not actually not in the cell environment, but more and more we'll have the option, you know, like of working in the uh, in vitro condition using single particle cryo -EM and really reaching like high resolution, uh, more and more high resolution or you can go to cell environment and understand the protein in situ in the, 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 the exactly cell compartment that you want to, to see the protein with the cells in the exact condition that you want to understand. Uh, so it's really a, a lots of different and open uh, 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 landscapes that we see in electron micro microscopy uh, applied to, to structural biology. No, I and I just have to thank thank Mikita because he put the, the link to the workshop here in our in our chat. Thank you, Mikita. You are welcome. Um, okay. Any other questions? I think there's uh, uh, again, Rodrigo Mont. Uh, thank you very much. Obrigado. <laughs> 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 nada. You are welcome. Confusion here sometimes, but. So thanks very much. Uh, always enjoy it. Uh, hope to see you again soon here in Belo Horizonte or in, in Campinas. Uh, everyone, we will start tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And so we will continue with uh, the next sessions. Uh, the next sessions will be with uh, Lucy Collinson from Francis Crick and Kildi Miranda from uh, UFJ. So we uh, talk about correlative light and electron mi microscopy and various other types of multimodal imaging. So thank you, every thanks everyone for attending today and uh, hope to see everyone tomorrow. Rodrigo again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank, thank you all and see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.